Hello everybody, this is uh, Shadi Reyes and this is uh, Heart Trending. With me is a special guest, he's a dear friend, uh, Dr. Hadi Alicia. He is an interventional cardiologist and at Ascension, uh, St. Thomas Ascension Heart Hospital in Nashville. His main clinical interest, probably majority of you on Twitter knows, is complex coronary intervention and peripheral intervention with default radial artery access. He specializes in critical limb ischemia and alternative uh, arterial access in the management of complex peripheral arterial disease. Probably you have seen a lot of phenomenal posts on him on Twitter and um, other social media platforms. He's also interested in deep venous intervention and percutaneous pulmonary embolism inter intervention. Hadi, thank you so much for being here today on the channel. And uh, today oh, we're going to... It's a big pleasure. Thank, thank you, you Hadi. for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as we discussed before, we're going live. Uh, we're going to talk about three main takeaways from the uh, TCT 2020. It was phenomenal. I can, you know, the, the fact that it was virtual and so well organized, so professional, everything on time. And everything nuggeted for the private interventional cardiologists. That was phenomenal for the fellows. Overall education, very well balanced. Right. We saw the resurgence of PCIs and live cases, which is amazing. So it was overall a very, very successful meeting. That's great. And um, assuming, um, unfortunate, I mean, the biggest draw for virtual meeting that we don't get to meet you in person and other friends. Uh, exactly. But uh, so at least we have a, a still a platform to learn from. I mean, the first trial we're going to talk about the ultimate trial at TCT 2020. They presented the three years follow up patient randomized to IVAS guided versus angiographic guided. So uh, at uh, 12 months, uh, as we all know, the difference was 5.4 in terms of MACE or major uh, target visit uh, failure, in the angiographic guidance compared to 2.9, so three point different in the two groups. However, at three years, uh, it was 10.7 for the angiographic guidance compared to 6.6 .6 in the um, IVAS guidance. What, what is, what's your practice in IVAS? How much do you do it? And if this trial changed your practice? Absolutely. This is, I think, honestly, this is the beginning of a practice changing era in the era of imaging. Uh, I use almost 70 to 80 percent of my PCIs are IVAS based. Uh, of course, I wasn't trained this way. I picked it up in practice and I learned in practice from all my colleagues and all these nice conferences. There are, uh, we'll talk about the barriers of uh, uh, adopting imaging in coronary interventions, but in terms of takeaways, this is definitely very clear that this is better for patients. If you want your family member to be on a cath lab table, you really want to ask for IVIS. Absolutely. You want the best long-term outcomes and this is the uh, first of a long series of studies, hopefully in the next few years, that will confirm that. Absolutely. Uh, basically, education is very important. Right. Getting through cases and uh, learning from colleagues is the very important. Secondly, the staff. You know, obviously, if the staff you're going to use it once a month or once every few months, of course, it's going to be cumbersome. It's going to take time. You're going to be frustrated. Right. The staff is going to be frustrated. So the more you use it, the more it flows. And I can right. tell you it definitely shortens cases. I am 100% confident about the vessel size, the length of the stent, I know exactly where I'm gonna land it. It shortens the case. And if, uh, you know, the, the IVIS catheter is connected quickly or OCT, if people are used to that, you can argue it is much faster. Now, of course, in this study, it was a little bit longer, about 10 to 15 minutes longer. Yes. And there was a little bit more contrast used. But of course, uh, this is center dependent. And if you are proactive from the beginning, you know you're gonna use IVIS, you can use less contrast and kind of account for that. Let me um, ask you. Is so it, it's a culture change. It it's, is. It's definitely, uh, you know, the other aspect is we get evaluated in the NCDR guidelines, on NCDR registry, based on immediate complications and immediate results, like right. hematomas, bleeding, acute kidney injury. Nobody looks at target vessel failure for you. Nobody looks at TVR in the no. registry. Absolutely. So if this becomes part of your actual data, what's your target vessel failure, Dr. Reyes? What's yeah. it? This is when people would shift really to imaging because this is the way to go to get the best long-term outcome. It's funny you mentioned that it uh, shortened the procedure because 
in private practice, you're busy, you want to just get in on and out the case quickly, uh, do a good job, but there's misconception that it, doing IVIS is an extra step and maybe it's going to prolong the Absolutely. procedure, but you're saying the other way around. Plus your confidence in choosing the post dilation balloon. There are some, you and I have seen vessels that look 2.5 on exactly. angio, and they're 4.5 by IVIS. And you're pulling, yes. of course, we have to be careful about sizing, but going like one quarter of a millimeter less than your media to media. And uh, yeah. you're much more confident going high pressure, getting maximal stent expansion without uh, taking a puff and waiting for a perforation. Absolutely. Do you, did you notice that with you utilizing more IVIS, you are seeing more uh, of the characteristics of the lesion? So you are performing more atherectomy or more debulking? Absolutely. It, it definitely works into the algorithm. So the co plaque composition, the plaque length, the plaque uh, distribution, uh, all of that factors into what strategy you're going to use and your overall uh, you know, sheath size, guide yeah. size, all of that. So obviously uh, there are a lot of implications and the criteria that were specifically uh, followed in the ultimate trial were three criteria that uh, all of us should really remember as much as we can is the minimal luminal, uh, is the uh, surface area of five millimeters square or larger or more than 90% of the distal reference area if you have a small vessel. Yeah. Uh, the second one was to land your stent within five millimeters of a uh, vessel that has 50% or less plaque burden. Right. And finally, less than three millimeters of stent edge dissection. So those three criteria have to be met in order to consider a PCI optimally Absolutely. optimal by, by IVIS. It's so a piece of not mind. just, uh, you yeah. know, you use an IVIS before you implant the stent and you get out. You usually you have to get IVIS afterwards and it's fast. It's just literally seconds. Absolutely. It's uh, it's different. You see more, you treat more and you optimize more uh, when you do imaging. I mean, phenomenal. I'm really surprised to, to hear that from you. And I, I agree with you, though, but with the timing of the procedure it's faster. You, you feel more peace of mind when the patient get off the table that you give this patient the best therapy ever with imaging. And uh, their staff is engaged. They love seeing those images. They know what we're dealing with. Yeah. You have that big center image, and you can see, show your patients also what you did and what kind of. So it's it's a multifaceted um, improvement in overall interventional care. So alluding to the staff point, uh, you mentioned you didn't learn this in the fellowship. Neither am I. I, am I. I picked it up in practice. Well, How, did you teach them? A little them? bit. You know, did you back teach them? Then, but uh, it wasn't as developed as it is right now. It yeah. was uh, just a niche. Product that you use only when you have a question, when you're, you're, you don't know what's going on, when you have a big question. This is when you pull the IVIS, and obviously this is associated with those tough cases where things are difficult. Yeah. We are proposing, and the entire community is proposing to adopt this as part of your inventory. If you don't want to go 100%, I think a healthy medium would be 50% of your PCIs, yeah. even in the straightforward lesions. You're going to be implanting longer stents. You're going to be implanting larger stents the, the more you use IVIS, that's for sure. Yeah. And you, and you were involved. Uh, sorry, and, you, and your partners were involved in teaching your staff more IVIS? Like it's, uh, maybe it's a new culture Absolutely. in your lab. And, uh, you know, industry is very helpful also. They have a full website of all the examples. I can go through them. It's very easy to get education these days. So the staff, obviously, they learn mostly as we go. Absolutely. And the discussion during the case, what we're seeing, what we're doing, why we're doing this, why we're doing that. Yeah. The next one is TECO-STEMI. Uh, and this is a very interesting trial. Again, the, the one-year outcome of this trial was presented at ACC 2020. This is comparing the uh, three months of DAPT followed with monotherapy with ticagrelor for 12 months compared to DAPT for 12 months straight. But then this cohort, they focus on STEMI. So... Uh, Right. So as you know, uh, they compared this, this trial to other trials like uh, Global Leaders and Twilight. They have a uh, number of STEMI where they basically excluded, but they have 36% of their cohort, almost one third or above, is STEMI patients. That's why they were kind of unique in that regard. So uh, again, as you discussed before, this is the 
two designs, one uh, two arm study. So again, at intention to treat primary endpoint in therapy of NACE, which is uh, myocardial infarction, MI death, myocardial uh, death related to myocardial infarction at 12 months. Uh, the ticagrelor uh, monotherapy or based uh, 12 months DAP was 5.0% 5. 5. compared to 3.7%. P-value was not significant. In terms of bleeding, uh, the, the definition they use in STEMI bleeding, it was definitely lower and the difference was statistically significant. Even with the landmark analysis from 30 days onward, there was 0% bleeding in the monotherapy compared to the DAP therapy. So again, maybe you are treating these patients in your practice uh, all the listeners on the Twitter as well as you, Hadi. So what is your strategy and would you incorporate this in your practice um, once it's into the guideline? Right. So I, I don't think it's practice changing yet. It will probably be in the next few years where we need a little bit more data, especially on the complex PCI patients. This is the subset that did not so well. It didn't do badly, but the difference was not statistically significant but the complex patient had a slightly higher ischemic uh, uh, outcome, adverse outcomes. Uh, you know, the thing that drove that, first of all, as all of us know, STEMI is the highest risk acute coronary syndrome. This is the most inflamed, most thrombotic patients. And obviously the 12 month DAPT was, even though stent endothelialization with the most uh, recent platforms is really almost complete within three months, the guidelines pushed for 12 months of DAPT, as all the previous uh, studies have shown, not specifically for target vessel, uh, target vessel failure, but the other lesions, the other non-obstructive lesions or obstructive lesions, the you know the throm thrombotic milieu, the inflammatory um, environment that the patient is in requires antiplatelet therapy for so long. So obviously with all these trials were shortening and we're trying to find that perfect uh, balance between ischemic outcomes and bleeding outcomes. Absolutely. And obviously the genius idea is not to drop the P2Y12, but to drop the aspirin. That seems to kind of um, make a change. confirm what global leaders and Twilight have shown and gets that sweet spot where you get enough antiplatelet activity to inhibit further ischemic events from the culprit and the non-culprit lesions, as well as minimize bleeding, which obviously correlates with mortality. Absolutely. So I love that, that fa the fact that we were able to confirm that in the highest risk patients. Obviously, Twilight excluded STEMI. Global leaders included STEMI. Overall, Global Leaders is such a large trial that the number of STEMI patients in that is actually larger than TICO STEMI. But um, the fact that this study focused on that along with the other ACS patients is very attractive. Right. Second issue is a cautionary issue. Uh, this uh, trial was done in Korea, South Korea. Yes. BMI was close to 25. So we have to be very careful about ticagrelor monotherapy in a 120 pound man versus a 250 pound man. So right. obviously we don't know yet. So we definitely need American and uh, Western European trials to confirm international trials to confirm that in different. And the third thing is obviously something that I found very clinically relevant, NACE, N with uh, N like in Nancy. So um, yeah. net adverse, so basically combining both bleeding and ischemic outcomes. Of course, this has been described in multiple previous trials, but I like it because that's what's clinically relevant. If someone, you know, people would think it's a statistical combination that is artificial, you're combining bleeding and ischemia at the same time, but it's actually what's clinically relevant. If a patient bleeds, you're gonna hold antiplatelet therapy, which will re raise mortality, raise events, and the opposite is true. If someone's ischemic, that's obviously very, important from a clinical standpoint. So combining those two in one uh, uh, composite outcome is clinically relevant. It's yes. not a statistical, artificial um, thing that the, um, the trialists have done. Well, so you... that's my take on it. Uh, and obviously, uh, the thing is, obviously, it's not practice changing, but if I have to, and especially in patients who 
require doe wax, I would feel a little bit more comfortable in an average size person to drop the aspirin by three months, even in STEMI patients. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because yeah. uh, there's um, uh, the DOAC, as you mentioned earlier, there's uh, other trials presented at TCT alluding to the fact for patients with high bleeding risk. Uh, we have other trial, for right. example, presented by Roxana Meran about the Zions 3090 uh, as well, yeah. studying different uh, period. I mean, again, this is maybe a very selective, narrow cohort of patients going to be not applicable for your day-to-day -day patient you see in the lab and in the clinic. And uh, the fact that you mentioned right. that this is a South Korean study, uh, maybe generalization of this finding on the cohort of patients we treat on a daily basis, maybe you have to be uh, cautious about that. All right, so let's move on, uh, Hadi, to the last one today is the uh, a very interesting and kind of changing right. the way we look at the drug-coated balloons in the peripheral. So this is a long-term uh, safety of drug-coated devices for peripheral arterial revascularization. This is an insight from Voyager PAD. So again, Voyager PAD published at the New England Journal showing that the uh, Zeralto or Rivaroxaban uh, twice a day plus aspirin is superior to aspirin plus placebo. But uh, again, there's a cohort of patients, given the fact that this is a large study, they looked into the outcome of patients who received drug-coated devices, uh, 1,358 patients, which is a good size number. And then when they compared them with the patient who did not, with unweighted analyses, there was a uh, slightly difference favoring the uh, drug-coated uh, devices. But when they did the weighted analysis, I mean, there was basically no difference between uh, the two intervention, either drug-coated co device or non-drug-coated uh, devices. And the mortality was no difference in each two group, and the cause of death was also not variable. So, uh, this is a major relief uh, for all of us endovascular specialists. Uh, we finally have the nail in the coffin of this theory that you know it was healthy for the overall interventional community to kind of re-examine things, but uh, we confirmed that this is a prospective study. Ascertainment of mortality was 99.5%, not like uh, the previous studies included in the meta-analysis where you have right. up to almost 38% uh, Patients were lost to follow-up and uh, very, very diverse. Uh, so uh, the very well, very well done study that confirms the absence of correlation between uh, drug-coated, specifically paclitaxel, and mortality. So that, uh, for us, that's basically it from a mortality perspective. Um, we're going to continue to practice like we used to, and th these devices are confirmed to decrease target vessel revascularization. Now the question is which one is the best? And this is when comparative analysis will be hopefully kicking in by uh, trials in the next few years. Uh, hopefully um, um, hopefully trialist initiated. Uh, the second issue is the uh, rivaroxaban. So obviously I am happy to see that also the fact you know, some patients got the triple therapy, but obviously with the lower dose of rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams BID with aspirin and clopidogrel. Mm -hmm. But there are patients who only get aspirin and rivaroxaban. The, um, and there's this very small subset of patients which got clopidogrel and rivaroxaban. So obviously there's a tiny little bit more bleeding as compared to the COMPASS trial and all of that. But um, overall, the outcomes are favored with this, uh, you know, treatment. Uh, treatment. Uh, so it's it's that also fine balance of a tiny small dose of anticoagulant in addition to potent antiplatelet therapy. Now, how long this uh, this trial did not address how long, and we can discuss things. But um, I think it's a step in the right direction, and it definitely it's definitely practice change. So let me ask you this, uh, Hadi, do you do routinely or when do you use rivaroxaban twice a day for PAD patient post-intervention? I try to use it on everyone unless the bleeding risk is elevated. So okay. as we know, it increases the, the bleeding risk slightly, but as the previous trials have shown, this bleeding is usually non-cerebral bleeding, usually, of course, every patient is different, and usually it is 
uh, it reveals GI abnormalities, GU abnormalities, cancerous abnormalities at early stage that theoretically the patient would benefit from that small bleed. Obviously, nobody wants to bleed, but if a bleed happens and it indicates a neoplastic process going on, usually it's a positive thing for overall patient health. But of course, we use patient with judgment. If patient is a high bleeding risk, we're not using it until we get off the dual antiplatelet therapy. My personal cocktail, and this is obviously not endorsed by any trial, I try to use clopidogrel with 75 daily with rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams BID, usually for three months, depending on the type of device that was implanted up to six to 12 months. And then silastazole is an additional antiplatelet agent, which has vasodilatory effects, I use it instead of aspirin. So uh, I use silastazole, clopidogrel, rivaroxaban, but of course, I don't have the data to show it. So far, you know, it seems the patient tolerated pretty well. The antiplatelet effect of silastazole is small. Uh, obviously, this was not studied by Voyager PAD, but just my personal practice. Would you would you that that this regimen dictated by if it is above knee or below knee? So the below knee, we get more aggressive. Mm -hmm. the, the vessels are smaller, the yes. lesions are longer. Usually there's tons of calcifications. Usually we have used atherectomy and usually we don't have a long drug loading stents. We, we have counted on long PTAs post atherectomy. Right. So this is when your cocktail has to be as aggressive more as aggressive. possible. Right. Uh, you can get away with iliac sometimes with just aspirin and rivaroxaban. Uh, and that has been proven to be okay. Um, right. There's nothing wrong with that combination. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned on the point the uh, that this trial is a relief to use DCB. Uh, now, as you know, the meta-analysis that brought up the whole mortality red flag is um, a, a combination of observation and RCTs. Don't you want to wait for somebody does meta-analysis that include these 1,300 patients into this meta-analysis and then come up with analysis before we kind of uh, uh, use DCBs again? You see, it's the, this meta-analysis by Dr. Katsanos uh, stands against at least seven to eight other major trials, real-world trials, industry-sponsored trials, um, investigator initiated trials and finally this randomized trial so the weight of evidence against the mortality signal is way stronger than the signal that was detected with this statistical um, I think it's a statistical fluke but because it doesn't make clinical sense but that's my personal opinion all right well, with that, uh, Hadi, I mean, I would like to call uh, all the people following you and myself is to just stay tuned on what you put on Twitter. Really, I'm really in phenom phenomenal oh, work and so amazed fun. by your work, Thank you. especially in the PAD space Thank and alternative so access and uh, the, the amazing job you do, you publish as well. As, uh, thank you so much for your early work and thank you for your time. I think yeah. honored to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Hadi. Thank you, Rita. Appreciate your time. And uh, please watch this video and others on uh, Heart Trending. This video is going to be recorded and stayed on Twitter, but also will be on the YouTube channel. Uh, Hadi, thank you so much for your time. Till next time, be safe.